So the, um, as I said, welcome to University of Greenwich. We so uh, would have loved to welcome you in person, but unfortunately, this is uh, as close as we can get for now. So the, my name is Olga Martin Ortega. I'm the professor of international law at the School of Law at the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences, University of Greenwich. And together with a team of amazing people uh, presenting today, uh, we've created the Unarchived Project. The Unarchived Project is uh, funded by uh, the university, by what's called the High Fund, Fund, which is the Higher Education Impact Fund, with the idea to trans transport this knowledge that we've acquired doing this very dry academic research of just reading and writing and writing um, articles with a lot of footnotes into something that is really valuable, uh, uh, has a social impact. And for this, the um, amazing graduates from the School of Law have worked to create this fantastic project you'll be hearing about and this event in particular. So a big shout out now to the team, which are uh, Jalen, Eva, Dilara, Rasa, Sarah, and Andre. Thank you very much, team. And um, as well, uh, a thank, a very strong thank you, a very uh, deep and, and felt thank you to the uh, Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences uh, support, uh, research and enterprise support team, and to Marco Thomas that encouraged us and led us to do an event uh, last year in the Royal Society of Arts that in a way is, is planted one of the seeds for this project. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on the uh, floor to our uh, fantastic chairs today, which are uh, Sarah Devi and Jaylan Atlas. And uh, as all that remains for me is to sit here and listen to our amazing um, speakers today. Thank you, Olga, for that lovely introduction. And welcome everyone um, to this webinar and dis a roundtable discussion really on looking at for sustainability in fashion. So firstly, we're going to really um, introduce our esteemed panelists that we're very thankful for joining us uh, this afternoon. So firstly, uh, you'll be hearing from Dr. Chamu Kupaswamy uh, from the University of Hertfordshire. Now, Chamu is a public international lawyer specializing in development law and is also a Chevening Scholar, convener of the Social Impact and Transition Research Group Center of Climate Change Research and the European Society of International Law's Environmental Law Interest Group. She's a happy 100 listy in 2014, a volunteer ranger and a classical uh, Indian dancer as well. Um, so we'll be hearing a lot from Chamu with regard to her work that she's been uh, conducting, I believe research as well, into um, the Indian sari. Wuzi uh, is our second panelist and Wuzi Omilale is the founder, designer and tailor of By Wuzi, which is an independent denim brand which focuses on sustainability and eco-consciousness. So Wuzi uses vintage Levi jeans to create bespoke pieces. Um, and what we'll be hearing a lot more is kind of how she started her work and how really it's integrating a lot of sustainability and really rejecting um, fast fashion, which we see a lot on the high street. And our third panelist is Karen De Silva, uh, who is a passionate and creative makeup artist with extensive experience in luxury makeup and skincare. Karen is highly knowledgeable in all things beauty with over five years of experience perfecting her expertise in the industry. And I believe she um, has done a lot of work in trying to integrate sustainable makeup into her work. So passing over to my co-chair, Jaylan, to introduce our three other speakers. Thank you, Zara. Mm -hmm. um, and our lovely speakers that have joined us today. Um, so our wonderful next speaker will be Dan uh, from Zero Negativity Clothing. And he started Zero Negativity with not only a focus on optimistic mindset, but having as little ecological impact as possible. Um, he set about building Zero Negativity from a company selling two types of white t-shirts, 
earth to the supplier of thousands of sustainable garments that it is today um, with customers from all over the world and he deals with the day-to-day -day running of the company and is the primary sales contact yet still has a hand in design production and customer service um, and then we have Liz from the OR Foundation uh, which is a USA and Ghana based not for profit working at the intersection of environmental justice, education and fashion development. Uh, the last five years, Liz has been working on um, in solidarity with the Cantamanto ecosystem to advocate for a more just secondhand clothing system, whilst also working to make improvements and um, to waste management and labour conditions on a mission to catalyse a justice led circular economy in uh, Accra in Ghana. Yeah. Um, and then our final speakers will be the unarchived textiles so Delara and Eva will just be making some announcements and some dates for clothes swaps and collections uh, so yeah should we hand it on to the first speaker yes so our first speaker will be Dr Chami Pibswami so Chami should I share your um powerpoint yes please time? yeah yes please um Thank you very much, everyone. Just very delighted to um, be here. Um, while Zara shares the slides, I think I'll just start by saying that in 2015, the UK Supreme Court started looking at climate change and the rule of law. So what was quite interesting was that they included the Commonwealth judges in looking at the climate change and rule of law. Now there's some good reason behind um, going international although we have a lot of work here in the UK to do about addressing climate change and emissions. Um, as it happens, the three big uh, emitters of greenhouse gases which are responsible for climate change are China, India, and can you guess the other country? No? Right, this is not a QA and a session. So, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the thing about India is that the uh, country is not just one of the three biggest emitters of greenhouse gas, but it's also the fastest growing emitter. So uh, from my perspective, I started thinking that if we need to address um, emissions and reductions of emissions and look at legal frameworks um, about doing it, we need to look globally and internationally as well. So my project, which is a research project uh, based in the university, but quite innovative because it is unconventional in the sense that it's not done in the usual way we do research in the universities. It involves a lot of non-academic people, as well as lot, lots of very different ideas about uh, what the research outputs are. So just to start off with, um, as I already mentioned, um, I'm focusing on um, one piece of uh, textile, which is the uh, sari. It's actually quite widely used um, in the diaspora, as well as in India, as well as in the uh, subcontinent and beyond as well. So the sari itself is um, more than just the costume and the textile. Um, as you can see in this wonderful picture, a model uh, who's posing for the UK designer, uh, Ayush Kejriwal, there's lots of elements to it. There is the makeup side, there is the jewelry side, uh, there is the artistic side, there's designs, there's a lot of things to it. So by addressing the sari, looking at sort of fashion uh, holistically here as well. Uh, next slide, please. The sari is really um, a very popular um, uh, piece of clothing. Um, it's, um, I think a lot of people use it as sari, but a lot of people use it as fabric for different purposes as well. Um, and I just want to show you the depth and richness of this costume and why actually people like it so much and therefore why it's a subject of such consumption uh, through two videos. So please bear with me while um, Zara plays the uh, two videos. It's going to take us about uh, four to four and a half minutes to go through both the videos. I'm hoping that it's going to be interesting for you to watch. Zara? If you can do yeah, the first just video. Getting those up. Yeah. Sorry, just bear with me.
Don't do it, Gabby. In a loud mouth, buddy? Hmm? In a loud mouth? You got your talk? Model, which is becoming more and more popular now. 
and uh, so you see though it, though it is started with the uh, you know some of the technology uh, the offering has started with that but now it's applicable across the industry sectors right now Thank you. I don't think we, we have any more questions. Any question that I can see. Um, as Manish mentioned, we will be sending a follow-up email. Um, we do have uh, the NSAP internet guide that you can Do you just want to continue your presentation once they get your slides back up? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Zara. So that was an introduction to the range and breadth of um, the uh, the sari itself. So in our uh, project, we actually introduced uh, the different types of uh, sari because not everyone is actually aware of the uh, types of saris that they may not actually be using. And I focused uh, on one particular type of sari because this is something that is used in dance. The, uh, my main objective was to look at how artists who use saris could become sustainable. So some of the values in the focus group discussions that we actually um, came up with was uh, longevity was one of the um, ways in, was one of the key values in how the dancer used the sari. It was also connected to memories and heritage, which was also linked to the uh, issue of longevity. This particular type of sari is, a, uh, is something that's done on a small scale. It's a small scale industry with um, uh, hand loom. So there's ethical values inbuilt into the sari. Um, so this is just a tip of the sort of issues that we encountered in uh, talking to those who use uh, saris in uh, dance itself. Next slide, please. We then also looked at the sari as a whole with its uh, makeup. The results that came out from this were twofold. We identified sustainable practices. Uh, for example, there was the use of natural material for makeup. So the red color, the black color that you see as part of the make makeup that was used. Uh, traditionally, there was a lot of use of that. So we listed a range of uh, different sustainable practices. And then we also identified uh, emerging practices with respect to sustainability. Uh, and we found a number of issues, three of which I've actually listed over here and a few more uh, we are in the process of um, analyzing and um, bringing to the fore. The Instagram dancer 
uh, often came out as um, being quite unsustainable in terms of the uh, increase in the costumes that are then required for new Instagram pictures, etc. I think you get the um, sort of idea. Next slide, please. Um, we also had um, uh, a look uh, outside of the focus groups with dancers and um, with uh, those who actually stitch costumes. And um, I looked at particular um, legal interventions that is possible. I've just put this slide in here for, um, you know, if there are any uh, lawyers in the group here, um, the key question that I was looking at is how can an intellectual property law mechanism, uh, especially one that's known as geographical indication, be used towards sustainability? If that's something that uh, people are interested in, I can pick up later on. I just get the feeling that it might not be an interesting question um, for the general audience. Next question, please. So the kind of things that we did in the workshop, we looked at the Sari's uh, footprint. Now, uh, those of us in sustainability know that it's very difficult to um, exactly uh, figure out the footprint for most uh, materials, a lot of activities as well. So this is something that we really needed to um, talk about. So uh, one interesting thing that came out, and I've highlighted that in green in this particular slide, uh, was the issue of uh, the silk sari, which I've already mentioned is being used a lot in uh, dance. And some uh, very encouraging figures um, on its footprint actually came out. So apart from the uh, animal cruelty aspect, uh, it came out quite positive in the um, other headings here. So uh, this is something that we're gonna take forward to look at um, how we might be able to uh, further the discussion on more usage of silk when it comes to uh, costumes. Next slide, please. Um, and this is uh, sort of my last slide. The uh, discussions and the conversations we've had about how dancers could use uh, sari sustainably is leading us to devise a fashion charter for South Asian arts. This is basically a commitment to know by those who are using um, textile, makeup and related um, objects and materials to know what the footprint actually is and then to actually act using a lot of different sustainability practices. Um, this is something that we uh, want to take forward so that uh, we have more and more uh, dancers and artists uh, across the world, whoever is using this sari, uh, to be able to um, know about, but also to commit to. And this is something going into the future we're interested in uh, taking forward. Um, and then the last slide. There are lots and lots of uh, books and saris. I mean, the academic I am, I've just put, put a list of slides where you can uh, see saris as well as read about saris. Um, so I think I'll uh, leave it uh, there. And if there are any questions, I can take it when the question time is there. Um, sorry for going a bit over my time, uh, Zara. That's okay. Thank you very much for that, Chamu. Uh, it's a really interesting discussion and a topic really on the sari that I'm hoping we can pick up in the uh, question and answer. Um, aspect of this discussion later on. Um, Wuzi, I'd like to uh, introduce and really pass the mic uh, <laughs> metaphorically to you and could you tell us uh, a bit more about kind of your work? I mean you've got a, um, a brand that upcycles I believe Levi jeans, is that correct? Yeah, um, what really got me, I've been learning a lot about sustainability it wasn't really taught so much when I was at uni. I went to LCF and I graduated in 2019. And it wasn't a huge topic like um, sustainability at uni. So I wasn't really interested. I didn't really think there was much of a, a huge conversation about it in terms of fashion. It, it hasn't only, it's only really started becoming a huge topic in fashion like lately, if I'm, if I'm honest, um, especially during the pandemic, it was a very huge conversation um last year um but after I left uni it was something that I felt like it was important to get myself into if I was going to start a fashion brand or become more engulfed in fashion and learning more I think it was important for me to um go about it in the more sustainable route and then when I learned about eco-consciousness it's not just about 
the clothing. It's about literally making sure that every step um, in your life, you're having a, you're you're more conscious in your in what you do in terms of um, being sustainable and recycling and reusing and not making everything short term. Basically, um, I have a like. Oh yeah. Also, thank you for <laughs> thank you for for this and um, you know making me speak and kind of things like that. But yeah, um, a quick little statistic. Um, it says here. Well, I got this from I think fashionrevolution.co.uk. Um, it says the average customer can waste up to seventy pounds of clothing per year, and globally we produce up to thirty million tons of waste each year, and. Uh, 95 percent with and 95 percent of which could be recycled or reused and basically that's where i come in where well by Wizzy is a sustainable and eco-conscious denim brand that i started last year and um i i use like you said vintage levi's to create new pieces in, in my opinion that only makes sense if I do ever get myself into using rolls of fabric again it'll be more of um discontinued fabric if that to be honest but I'm really on this path of being smarter with when it comes to fashion um I think does fashion, I think one of my questions was, um, sorry, I'm not very good at like interpreting <laughs> right, no my, um, but um, is fashion a threat to the environment? I think the general answer is yes. Yes, fashion is definitely a threat to the environment, but it's illegal to, to go outside naked. So <laughs> until it's legal to go outside naked, I guess we have to wear clothes and that's why I try to be um, open about the fact that, yes, I would love people to enjoy my, enjoy, um, my designs and of course buy um, pieces that I produce, but to think a little bit more about, instead of, um, it, it, think about more of quality, think about, um, instead of going being so hooked on sales because I think last year it was like pretty little thing and boohoo did like a 99 percent <laughs> sale and of course that draws you in oh my gosh what can I buy what can I buy that's like 2p but it's not first of all it's not gonna last very long and you're gonna have a bunch of clothes that was made by by people that work in bad conditions um, don't get paid a lot. And I think that's something that Pretty Little Thing or the Boohoo team is getting like sued for at the moment. So it's like, that's what I try to, I don't wanna be too heavy and push because not everybody is in that place, but I think it's just important to just be conscious of it and have that in your mind. Um, yeah. Would, you say, would you say it's more the um it's the it's not necessarily fashion or the fashion industry itself but it's more that it's the production patterns and it's the consumption really patterns the way that the um maybe in society the way we're kind of we all want a lovely uh, a good bargain really and it's those it's that really behavior um and that mentality that is damaging really damaging to the environment and damaging I think to society due to the impact that it has on other individuals really across the world would you say it's more that uh, than fashion in itself being a danger yeah I think you, you just said it perfectly I think it's, it's the mentality I think what when we are able to like I said be more conscious and slowly think change our mentality in terms of um the sales and the bargains and wanting all of that I think that's when slowly the um brands will start changing the way that they market as well because maybe we won't be buying so much so they will be more conscious of or 
yeah, be more conscious of what they do in terms of what they, how they deal with things behind the scenes. And then that will change everything going along. And yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much for um, clarifying that and providing kind of your your experience with um, in creating your uh, brand. Um, I'm hoping to pick up on some aspects of that really in the discussion as well, but yeah. I am conscious of time as well. Yeah. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce and really pass the mic to uh, Karen De Silva. Um, who works really in the, we're moving away from kind of the textile sort of industry and moving more towards fashion as an art form uh, through makeup as well. So, um, Karen. Hi, hi everyone. Hiya. <laughs> so, um, you work primarily in the makeup industry, is that correct? You're a makeup artist, yes? Yeah. yeah. So, I've been a makeup artist now for about five, six years. And of course, I've pretty much done every single aspect from doing the shop floor and the retail to also doing shoots and you know editorials and seeing kind of the backstage of everything also. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk to you guys today about kind of all like the behind the scenes and also animal testing and also how much of an impact, you know, individuals do have on um waste and plastic waste and water waste as well um okay so i first wanted to go into the dreaded animal testing <laughs> okay so as you guys probably know a lot of brands tend to use animal testing as a way of seeing how products will obviously react on on people once they do use or consume them. Um, so animal testing is something that has obviously been banned in the EU, however, it's still used globally. So it's used in about 80% of countries in the world, which is like disgusting pretty much. Um, and also another thing is that about, I think it's somewhere between 100 million to 200 million animals, they die every single year from animal testing, which again, like I said, is completely disgusting. Shouldn't be allowed, but unfortunately it is. Um, so with that being said, we do have organizations that have been put in place, such as the Pace Organization, if any of you guys have heard of it before, and also at the Leap and Bunny as well, which are two organizations that basically work with companies to ensure that they are doing what they can to eliminate user animal testing and um, user animals in production of their products. Um, however, with this being said, a lot of companies are, of course, selling a lot of their items over in China where animal testing is actually compulsory. So you are not allowed to sell any of your items over in China unless they have gone through a stage of animal testing prior to them being put on the shelves. And then again, next, like I said, we have PayTar, which of course is something that is amazing because their aim is to have the logo. So the bunny, which uh, represents the cruelty free in products. Um, however, with that, you don't have to actually provide any information. You don't have to um, show anything to prove that you as a company are put in, in um, independent audits to show that you are taken a leap, leap or taken a stand against animal testing and a brand that is kind of being you know being pushed over the fence with this is um Dove because they work very strongly with um Paytar in order to get rid of animal testing however again like I said they, they do sell their products and do plan to sell their products over in China which means that regardless of them putting out all these press releases and showing that they're against animal testing they're still you know doing these things over in foreign countries and that could of course be very very misleading to people especially considering that you know a company like Dove is kind of like a household name and it's used by millions of people around the world as well. And a way that we can actually cut this is through on-chip technology. So I'm not sure if any of you guys are aware, a little bit scary actually, but there is on-chip technology, which is essentially kind of like a human, but on a chip. 
So they have different organs, like your hearts, they have your lungs, your kidney, et cetera, which um, basically would mimic what we have as humans. However, it's on a chip and that way they could actually test our products using um, the chips and it'll give you more of, a, of an accurate um, response to how it would be if a human was to use it rather than on an animal instead. So that would be a solution that obviously the makeup industry could use to combat um, animal testing. However, it is extremely, extremely expensive to carry out these studies, of course. And then secondly, I wanted to go into our water consumption. Um, because it strongly, of course, links into animal testing. Um, obviously, in, in order to nurture these animals and, you know, look after them, a lot of water is being used. And I think it's about 80% of the um, formulas that are on the market at the moment um, contain water and use a lot of water when it comes to the animal testing also. Um, also, one thing that has recently come into play a lot is the use of aqua in um, skincare products. So that's become really popular within like the last two years. And essentially it means that it's skincare and makeup that is run by water. And essentially it's this whole notion of like being hydrated and having super dewy skin, which I feel like is kind of a hype at the moment, you know, fitting into the whole Instagram aesthetic that we currently see a lot. And of course, like I said, with the whole, you know, sustainability act, it's like, okay, so we're trying to stray away from, from certain things. However, we are replacing them with things that are just as, just as bad for the environment, such as, such as how much water we do use. Um, also speaking on fragrances, for example, and hairsprays, they are all of course run by water and they actually pollute the environment and pollute the earth as much as car emissions do. So every single time you was to sp spray a fragrance on yourself, that is of course polluting the air that is around us and of course going into our water and our streams as well. Um, so a way that again we can combat this is going into waterless beauty which has been seen a lot over in Korea so recently we have we have seen a growth in waterless beauty and they do they do say that Korea is like the skincare central so whatever they do we tend to follow so yeah waterless beauty is a way that you can as an individual try to, to limit how much waste you're you're creating um, and then also using products that don't affect our coral reefs, for example, because I'm not sure if you're all aware, but using SPF is super, super bad for our coral reefs. It's really bad for marine life. So you could also find products that are actually really safe um, for the marine life instead. And then also um, you can aim to use products that are completely beadless. So no use of microbeads, no use of microplastics, because of course, once you wash off all your makeup off your face at the end of the day, and you kind of wipe everything down, all the toxins that are actually inside of your products just go down into the sink and they pollute our waters as well. And I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the um, Dirty Dozen, which is a name for a list of ingredients that pollute our waters, but are in a lot of the products that we have. So, so in our poos, in our conditioners, um, even in our toothpaste. And these are preservatives that essentially once they do in the drain, they kind of combine together and it's, and it's very, very difficult to get out of water. And all of these things, again, like I said, they're consumed by marine life, they're consumed by the fish that we eat, the water that, that we drink. So essentially it is actually damaging for us as well as humans. So causing ourselves you know cancers, like I said and and um damaging our damaging our food chain okay thank so you then of course the last thing I want to do <laughs> sorry I'm trying to be aware of the last thing that I wanted to go into was packaging and this I would probably say is the main thing that you know in the makeup industry we kind of are really really bad like really bad um so we actually in the makeup industry it's 120 billion units of packaging is created every single year and 146 tons of that actually just ends up 
in, in landfills and, and majority of that, so 70% of the, of the products that end up in landfills, they're actually half, half full. So we're not completely using the products that we do actually have. And then we're, of course, like buying more and consuming more because we have these plastic bottles or these glass bottles that we're throwing away that are contaminating waste, even though we are making the conscious effort to attempt to recycle them. Um, and then also another thing is that we could use, of course, bio biodegradable plastics um, that would end up decomposing inside of these landfills. However, we do have to ensure that we're kind of pulling apart all of the products and, you know, sanitizing everything, washing it and then throwing it away. But then obviously, if you look at it from a consumer side, that is, of course, almost asking for, for too much, you know, from, from a consumer. Um, and we do also have companies that are very aware of this at the moment. So you have um, brands such as Lush and Mac that kind of do this scheme where they allow you to bring back, let's say, five or six products. And then in return, you, you, you can pick a product that you can take back home with you. So that way you're kind of making more of a conscious effort to make sure that you're not wasting the items that you do have and kind of making a bit more use for them as well. Um, and then you also have companies such as Garnier and Walida and Colgate as well that actually encourage you to bring back the items that you um, do have that are, that are empty and then that way they can dispose and recycle of them properly. So if you don't have, have the resources to be able to dispose of your items, they can handle that for you. Um, and then, like I said, again, so it's just kind of making a conscious effort to of course, pick the pick the routes that are a lot more sustainable. So, such as limiting your use of cotton buds, um, using wipes, for example, as well, and kind of replacing these things with everyday items, like just using a towel and some water to wash your makeup off, rather than going in and using a whole routine that is essentially unsustainable and that is polluting our earth. And that's me. And if you guys do have any questions, of course, you can go ahead and ask at the end as well. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I think we are getting a couple of questions as well. Um, so we're going to pick up on those later on. I will now pass on to my co-chair, Jaylan, who will, I believe, um, lead, pass the mic to our other speakers. Thank you, Zara. And thank you, Karen. That was very insightful. I guess not many people think about um, makeup when thinking about sustainable fashion. So that was like a different perspectives and the alternatives to uh, you know, using cotton pads, because I use a lot of cotton pads, but then I got reusable ones and it's so much more useful. Um, and you could just wash it and it's fresh again. So thank you. Um, so our next speaker is now Dan. Um, Dan, so you'll be talking to us a little bit about zero negativity. Uh, what does sustainable fashion mean to you? How do you make your clothes? The floor's yours. Right. Um, well, hello. Thank you for having me, everybody. Um, so I kind of stumbled into this world, actually. Um, I was, up until a couple of years ago, uh, a miserable police officer based in York. Uh, and it was, I was looking for a way out, basically. And I had no, I'd never had any interest in fashion or any kind of background in it or anything like that. Um, and I was, I'd kind of forgotten where the kind of... Uh, idea for the business came from but then I was talking to him on about it and we, we recalled this conversation that we'd had in in John Lewis so we don't we were walking around John Lewis looking at stuff having a chat and a coffee and what have you and I picked up a t-shirt and I think from memory it was a Lacoste t-shirt or something like that and it was like 60 quid for this see-through white t-shirt with a little crocodile on it and I thought to myself there's no way this should cost so much for something that is in reality, doing very little to help anybody along. You know, the Lacoste and John Lewis will make a massive margin on it, and everybody who's actually put any work in throughout the process will, will make a minuscule amount. So that's kind of where the idea came from about let's start a fashion brand and make sure that everybody throughout the process is kind of looked after and, um, you know, and, and just kind of do the best we can. I didn't know anything about sustainable fashion or fashion at all at that point. So we set the business up, started doing um, doing what we were doing, looked into sustainable print methods and stuff like that, uh, and essentially started off with a, a male, a men's 
slash unisex t-shirt and a women's cut t-shirt and, and that was it and we just printed different designs on them and sold them um, and started off with this charitable idea a bit like Tom's shoes where for everyone that we sold we gave one to charity great idea um, and it would have worked if we'd had millions of pounds to market it <laughs> but we didn't so eventually we kind of over time, you know, businesses develop and evolve. And, and what we do now basically is um, we are a clothing supplier. So we're a supplier of custom clothing to organizations up and down, well, all over the world, really. Um, and with our kind of thinking behind that is that fashion brands, sustainable or not, are essentially encouraging people to buy things that they maybe don't need um, because if you bought, you know, or the kind of buy well and buy once kind of idea, whereas the money, if you're from a commercial point of view, you're trying to make a living, you need people to buy more than they actually need, which, which obviously isn't the most sustainable business practice. It's kind of a bit of an oxymoron. So then we thought, right, well, how can we, let, let's look at people who legitimately buy clothing and see if what we can do is they're going to buy it anyway, universities, football teams, those kinds of things, they're going to buy it anyway. So let's reduce the impact of the clothing that they buy. So that's that's kind of where we we started and we looked into. Um, and I wasn't really aware of any of the science or the actual statistics behind it. And I think once I looked into that and started reading up on it and learning more and incorporating that into our um, marketing copy and and the sales pitch when we'd speak to potential clients. They're blown away by it and i was as well when you know you look at uh, a, a typical hoodie for example so universities the reason i'm kind of involved in and know a few people down at greenwich is because universities are one of our big sectors um because obviously they buy hundreds if not thousands of hoodies and t-shirts and sports kit and stuff every single year when you look at the numbers Water, just using water as an example, because um, I know Karen touched on it before, uh, a conventional cotton hoodie that's just made from your kind of, your cotton that's GM modified and everything like most of the cotton is that's in use nowadays, uses nearly 10,000 litres of water to create a single hoodie. You switch that over to organic cotton, it reduces that impact by 91%. And that is obviously an, an enormous saving alongside um, the energy statistics and the CO2 emissions that, are, that, that reduce as well through the use of organic materials. So that was one side of it. And then the business, we thought there's probably loads of businesses that say, oh yeah, well, you can buy an organic cotton hoodie off us. But we decided that what we were going to do is not just have an organic offer. We just said, right, everything that we do is going to be sustainable. So every product that we offer is either recycled or organic or a blend of the two. Um, or it's made from something that's recyclable, you know, or, or not single use. Um, and every stage of our process is sustainable as well. So we don't we don't we don't screen print with plastic or inks or anything like that. We only use water based ink, um, and our print methods aren't the kind of normal ones that you'd get from a from a t shirt supplier which is what we are essentially at the end of the day. Um, our packaging, we don't use any plastic packaging. Uh, we offset all of our carbon emissions, even though they're extremely low from what was calculated. We use the carbonfootprint.com um, company to kind of estimate our the, the, the little amount that we do actually emit. And I think for last year, it was something like 260 uh, kilos or something. It was a, it was a real small amount. Um, and we we offset through tree planting schemes ten times our carbon emissions. So the, the only neg what we do say is the only negativity we like at zero negativity is carbon negativity. So it's a bit cringe, isn't it? But um, so yeah, so that's us. So our kind of main focus for this year is what now universities are starting to open up again is getting back in there with people like Greenwich and. Um, we work with Lancaster, Manchester, Bradford, Leeds Arts, Exeter. We're already kind of guys that are on board with us and, and buy our product um, and get involved with things like this and, and try and 
spread that message because students care is is one of the big things and, and unfortunately we come up against we, we maybe speak to a students union and the people involved with the union think yeah that's fantastic that's great that's exactly what we need and that's exactly what we want from our university and then we get signposted to a, a procurement department or a finance department who, who don't care all they care about is the numbers um, and they've got tender processes and they've got contracts and this that and the other and for us it's it, we need a bit of a kind of a campaign really that spreads throughout edu the education institutions of the country and that says no actually there is an enormous impact that we're having through what we choose to buy and you know every it's a bit of a rite of passage isn't it everyone when you start uni you get a whatever uni it is hoodie um and nobody's really stopping to think about those those impacts and most universities obviously have, will have a sustainability policy but often clothing is massively overlooked when it comes to those policies and it's to do with the amount of printing that you do or recycle paper cups and putting bins out around campus and things like that which are all great but you, I think they're kind of missing this low hanging fruit is what I like to call it you could have an enormous impact by just switching over to a more sustainable um, clothing option and it's, it's, it's apathy a lot of the time is our biggest enemy when it comes to stuff like that so um, yeah I've got some kind of questions that I'll answer a bit further down that I got sent before so you know during the question and answer session about our materials and, and a few other bits that we do day to day within the business um, uh, but I will um, hand the mic back as it were. Thank you so much Dan that was very interesting. Um, should we now pass it on to Liz because I know we are short on time. Um, I'm yes. share my screen. Perfect, thank you. So hi everyone, um, very nice to be here and I've really enjoyed the conversation so far. So again, um, just a brief recap, I'm Liz Ricketts, co-founder and director of the Orr Foundation. We're a USA and Ghana based nonprofit. And for the last five years and sort of what I'm gonna be focusing on is our work in the secondhand clothing trade. Um, which we've been working with the Kantamanto community in Accra, Ghana since 2016. And let me just see, I don't know if, is it, are you able to share the slides? Yes, one second. Okay, I'm <laughs> just making sure I'm like, I can share. Um, so real briefly, when it comes to this topic, um, you know, we engage at a lot of different levels. So consumer awareness, um, speaking directly with brands, um, advocating for garment worker rights, engaging in conversations like this. Um, but our goal, again, is really working towards the justice of circular textiles economy, which I'm happy to answer more questions about in the Q&A. But I think to be able to get there, I need to offer you some context on what the secondhand clothing trade actually is. Because when most of the time when all of us donate clothing, we put it in a bin or we drop it off at a charity shop, that's the last that we think about it. We don't really consider what happens to it after then. Um, and there's also a lot of myths that have been built into this industry around it being charity when it's really not charity and also around it being considered recycling when it certainly is not. So basically when you donate clothing in the global north, um, it varies by country, but it's safe to say that it's between 10 to 20% of what you donate is gonna be actually resold in your country and the rest of it is going to go through a very long invisible supply chain that often will involve going to multiple countries um, and being sorted out by quality until it eventually is exported typically to the global south and so for me just this is a good place to start which is that you know what many of us consider as second hand is actually the primary supply chain for over half of the planet and so all of the conversations that we're having as a sustainability community about labor rights, about environmental impact within what we call the first-hand economy, we need to be having that same sort of critical lens when we're talking about the second-hand economy. Next slide, please. So um, again, uh, we work in the Continental ecosystem. So Continental is the largest secondhand clothing market in West Africa. It's probably the largest in the world. 
um, just by size, it's massive. So the retailer side of Constance is seven acres in size and the importer side, which is right next to it is about 15 acres. And every Thursday, every week of the year, importers unload these containers um, that contain over 400 or more bales that have been shipped by the Global North. And on Thursdays, retailers buy these bales for anywhere from $75 to $500 a piece. And each bale is basically um, priced off of two factors. So one is the country of origin and two is the garment type. So ladies tops from the UK, men's jeans from the US, for instance. Um, Contamanto sees 15 million garments a week um, and the population of Ghana is just over 30 million people. So that's a lot of clothing. And there are at least 5,000 registered stalls in this market and an estimated 30,000 people total who work here. Again, most of them selling and upcycling used clothing, but there's also restaurants, banks, other businesses, and you know people sort of servicing the retailers. And Contamanto is in the heart of Accra, so it's nestled between two very massive food markets. So the point being that there's um, a lot of people there every day, six days a week shopping, like you're pretty much never not touching another human being or a pile of clothing. Next slide. So there's a lot of different ways to um, think about Contamanto and they're all equally important. So one is that it is a model of sustainability. Um, Ghanaian citizens have a very different way of looking at clothing um, than most of us in the global north because they grow up taking cloths to a local tailor and having things made to fit their body. So they have a very intimate um, sort of relationship with fashion and they apply this to the way that they shop um, secondhand. And it's this kind of consumer agency and what, you know, what is considered indigenous sustainability logic that makes Contamanto a model of, again, what we in the Global North now call circularity. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a leading circular economy think tank, reports that doubling the number of times a garment is worn could lower fashion greenhouse gas emissions by roughly 44%. And you have a lot of technology-enabled resale platforms like ThreadUp or Vestiaire Collective um, that are attracting you know, a lot of investments and media attention globally for their work. Um, but I bring all of this up not to detract from what they're doing. All of that is very important. But what's important to also understand is that Contamanto is responsible for extending the life of far more garments than any reuse platform in the global north. So for comparison, ThreadUp's 2020 report states that they have recirculated 100 million items total since um, they started about 10 years ago. And by comparison, Contamanto recirculates that same amount every four months. Um, but the difference being that whereas platforms like ThreadUp have received $300 million in investment, Contamanto retailers are going into debt um, and they have no outlet after they cannot sell it. Um, Contamanto is also a model of sustainability because it's not, again, simply a place to shop. Um, it's also basically a design studio and a factory all in one. So there's clothing constantly being rethought and reworked at all levels. There's tailors and seamstresses, screen printers, whole sections of the market that are dedicated to kind of over dyeing clothing. And then also people there just committing to acts of care, like ironing, mending, and washing the clothing that we send. Next slide. Um, but Contamanto is not a utopia. <laughs> There's no such thing as a retail utopia. And um, secondhand clothing markets, you know, cannot absorb everything that we are creating. Um, at the end of the day, our research found that 40% of the clothing that's flowing through Contamanto leaves the market as waste. And that's usually within only one week of landing at port. So that's a very short lifespan. Um, and I want to be clear, you know, this clothing is not going to waste because it's unwearable. Um, it simply does not have enough value because the sheer quantity of excess has kind of driven down the prices. And also because this amount of excess teaches people that clothing is disposable. Um, clothing waste from Contamanto is handled in two ways. So one is formally by the government and two is informally um, just by individuals. And in terms of formal, um, the local government, the AMA, they pick up 70 tons of clothing waste from Contamanto every single day. Again, it's important to recognize that Contamanto is the largest consolidated point of waste for the entire city of Accra. So it's possibly the largest consolidated point of waste for the entire country of Ghana and its foreign clothing waste. Next slide. Um, so this 
70 tons a day was being dumped. Uh, is it not playing? Bummer. Um, was being dumped in Pone landfill. And the video is not playing, but um, it's a video of a fire that happens at the landfill. Um, Secondhand clothing from Contamanto alone represents 20% of the planned capacity of this landfill, which is very high. So in the global north, it's typically no more than 8% of landfill. Um, and again, there's this question of like, why are we sending clothing to countries that don't have landfills? And it's important to recognize that kind of a sanitary landfill or what we, um, what we know of, of as a landfill in the global north, that's very expensive. Um, and it's uh, sanitary landfills are pretty much exclusive to the global north. Um, and so Pone actually was financed by the World Bank. And when they were making plans to um, for this uh, landfill, they basically did not account for foreign waste. You know, why would they account for foreign waste? And so in 2019, it caught on fire, um, it exploded, and it's been unusable since. Um, and I happened to be there that day, and I'm sorry you can't see the um, video. Are you able to pull up for the other slides? I can, do you wanna make me the host and I can share? <laughs> okay, so um, this is now, all right, so before I talk about this, basically a lot of the clothing never goes to the landfill. Um, even before it exploded, it wasn't um, being sent there because there simply isn't the capacity to deal with it. So most of the clothing waste is actually ending up directly in the ocean. Um, you know, millions of garments sort of washing up on the shore. And then this image that you're looking at is the informal settlement um, where a lot of the clothing waste um, is sent. And this is in the backyards, you know, of where people live, um, where they get their water, where their cattle graze, um, and it's often um, burned. And there's 80,000 people at a minimum that live here. This landfill that you can see the picture of is 30 feet tall and it's over 60% clothing waste. And this waste does more than cause environmental destruction, which is really important for us to always be thinking about, you know, what is it? Uh, what is happening besides um, what's happening to the environment? Because this waste, because it is dumped on across most vulnerable citizens, it's used to basically further disenfranchise them. So it's used to blame them, um, to blame people who are living in poverty for this um, filth, basically. And then that's used to target them for demolition. Um, so essentially to erase their homes um, and their communities. And similarly with the ocean waste, it's not just that it's causing uh, harm to the marine environment, but it's also that it wraps around the fishermen's um, like motors, which then becomes dangerous for them. They have to go further out to sea, which costs more money, but also the clothing waste is literally catching on their nets to the extent where we just, a few weeks ago, I was talking to a fisherman who almost capsized because he was trying to pull his net up and it was caught on so much clothing waste. So clothing waste, again, clearly has environmental impacts, um, but the other issue is the debt cycle um, that's basically fueling all of this. So when retailers in Ghana get a bail, um, they sort it into different selections and basically they have to make most of their money back off of just 18% of that bail. Um, which is why retailers call their job a gambling job and less than 20% of them are actually making a profit. Uh, okay. so the next slide. So quickly, the other social impact has to do with what's happening in the fashion industry. Um, so the, the second hand... <laughs> Sorry, I can't. the secondhand clothing trade has basically made it all but impossible for 
um, local designers to succeed because not only do they have to compete with the cheap price of the secondhand clothing, um, but it also means that they have to design for a foreign customer. So Ghanaian designers have to constantly be thinking about what someone outside of their country wants and designing for them instead of designing for people in their own region, um, which will further just perpetuates colonialism. Um, last slide. The last sort of implication that I'll touch on is again, the labor within this supply chain. So um, to transport the bales between the importers and the retailers, they have to be head carried. And they're carried by women called kaie, which translates literally to she who carries the burden. And most of these girls, they can be as young as eight years old. Most of them are climate migrants from the northern region of Ghana. And they're pay paid barely anything um, to take these bales to and from between 30 cents to $1 per trip. And they live in debt slavery, but also the labor itself is backbreaking and can sometimes be fatal uh, when their necks break under the weight of these bales. Um, because these bales, again, weigh usually their entire body weight or more. Um, and so that's the end of the presentation, but I'm happy to take questions about um, sort of what we're doing to change this or how you can get involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I actually have a question. Um, let me just move. Okay. Um, yeah, I just had a question on um, why you wanted to focus on Cantamanto specifically as part of the OR Foundation and what you do to help the people working in the labor. Yeah. So, I mean, we've been working in Ghana for over 10 years. Um, was started, I mean, my entry point into Continental was doing upcycling. So I'm a trained designer and my work in sustainability um, around 15 years ago started from an upcycling lens. And um, we have, I mean, we have a commitment to this community. So for us, you know, it's, it's a community that I've been engaging with for most of my adult life. And the reason that we decided to focus on the research was because what we, the way that the conversation around circularity, the way that the secondhand clothing trade was being positioned um, as inherently positive and sort of um, oversimplified narrative was not matching up with what we knew on the ground. And so that's why we launched the Dead White Man's Clothes Project in 2016. And then in terms of what we do, we do a lot of different things. So. We have direct aid, you know, food relief. Um, for we do right now, um, we're trying to open a recycling lab um, that will allow for us to take some of that waste and um, turn it into new streams, product streams, but in a way that really is prioritizing taking people out of debt. Um, and then with the CAIA, we have a lot of different programs, again, trying to train them in new fields storytelling workshops, teaching them photography and videography so they can tell their own stories, um, apprenticeship programs, again, direct aid, and then a food sovereignty program. Amazing, thank you. I know there are a lot of questions, but uh, we're just going to move on to the final speakers who are the Unarchived Textiles. Um, the co-founders are um, myself, Delara, and Eva. Um, and I'll just pass it on to them to speak. Yeah, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay, um, Zara or Jalen, can you just share the video but not play it for now? Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and thank you for all your contributions. Um, I just want to start off by saying We'll um, talk about what we do at Dine Archives, and um, I will talk a bit about what motivated us to start this, and then we will show you the video that's just here, and then my friend, my colleague Eva, will continue about what we can do and how we're using this project to give people the option to do something. So I just wanted to say, um, apart from the clothes shop, um, sustainability is sustainable fashion is at the core of our project, but that isn't just the that isn't just the um, clothes shop. There's also research going on, which we are hoping to use to support and lobby governments. 
Um, but we created this vision with the opportunity with um, to give people the opportunity to actively do something about the dangers of fast fashion, such as um, modern slavery and forced labor in sweatshops, or even the water pollution caused by toxic dyes that end up in river streams in Asia, or the harmful harvesting of cotton that deprives indigenous people of their land that they use to survive of. However, this is not to say the fashion industry is the enemy which must be defeated. Rather, we want those at the top of the industry, the CEOs, the shareholders, to take accountability of the production of garments throughout the supply chain, starting from the harvesting of raw materials to the forced labor in the, um, factories, where they create cheap, poor quality clothes that will shortly end up in a landfill. So the creation of um, clothes for cheap to be sold for very cheap is the problem, which highlights an even bigger issue of capitalism, where the actual cost of clothing, clothing has been sidelined and we are merely left with the cost of an, on the label. Um, moving on, um, the unsustainable production um, leads to a vicious cycle of unsustainable consumption where consumers buy cheap clothes more often only um, for them to be thrown out within a year to, due to the poor quality, as Wizzy was saying earlier. Um, however, we're not the ones to shame and guilt people. Um, I even find myself looking at fast fashion because the alternatives are far too expensive and not always accessible. And I'm sure other people, even our guests today, are in the same boat as I am. Therefore, the fashion industry should work together to provide um, sustainable clothing that is affordable and accessible by all people as abusers of fast fashion is a human rights issue affecting the most marginalized communities as um, Liz has discussed. Um, moving on, um, I wanna talk about what happens to the clothes once we're done. Liz has mentioned um, her work and the landfills. Um, the average American has been estimated to throw away around 37 kilograms per year of clothes. Um, around 85% of all textiles thrown away in the US. Give it a second whilst we meet this lovely lady. I think that's good. Okay, yeah. Around 85% of textiles end up thrown away in the US, and um, which is roughly 16.9 million tons in 2017 and of those only 15.2 percent are recycled and the remaining ones are um, dumped or burnt um, and most of the, these statistics are, are from the US but that does not mean we're far from the reality here in the UK or even Europe um, globally an estimated 92 million tons of textile waste is created each year and the equivalent of to a um, rubbish truck full of clothes ends up in a landfill site every second so you may be asking, where are these clothes being dumped? Because in the West, we don't see them. Um, as Liz has um, discussed, um, most, as with most of the practices in fast fashion, out of sight, out of mind. Um, our waste dump is dumped in countries like Malaysia, Ghana, China, and Turkey to count some. And those countries have an economy that rely on the production of clothes, um, which must be changed. Moreover, some of these landfill dumps are illegal practices and affect the well-being of the people living and relying on that land, as seen in Malaysia and Cambodia. There is a crisis of transporting and dumping our waste of foreign countries where they are burnt, releasing toxic chemicals that have lifelong effects. Um, and the cost of transporting this waste is huge, but it is much cheaper than dealing with it in the West. Therefore, the damage to the pockets of greedy CEOs outweighs the livelihood of thousands of people around the world. As a result, to combat this issue, we wanted to get people swapping, give them something to actively do. And this is, this is something that we've done with our siblings and our friends and families for years. So why not do it within our community? So hence the clothes shop, the opportunity to find new clothes without costing someone's lives and having to cheat having to pick from cheap, um, fast fashion clothing and expensive, sustainable clothing. And now we will have the video talking a bit more about what we do. Um, I think Eva wants to speak before I start the video. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Delara, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you, Jalen and Zara, for sharing the event. Um, so now the question is, why should you go to the clothes shop? Firstly, it is cost effective as in clothes shopping is exceptionally less um, 
explain kids and buy new clothes. Second, you are contributing to saving the planet. A large portion of natural resources are using the production of clothes, such as water. And clean drinking water is very scarce right now. For example, 700 liters of water is used in production of a single pair of jeans. So when people shift from buying new clothes to shopping clothes, a lot of water is saved, which is great. However, um, I'm not here to tell you to stop completely buying from fast fashion. This is because fast, fa fast fashion is not just about clothing. It's about our disposable society, that is uh, one outfit every day. Uh, this department falls within the globalization and logical efficiency of the 21st century. Fast fashion has democrat democratized luxury trends for everyday shopper, but it comes at a cost that is not reflected in the price tag. Um, and that cost, uh, and government workers are the ones that suffer this cost. Retailers have pledged to ensure safer la labor conditions for supply chain workers, but continue to also outsource some of their clothing production to countries like India, Bangladesh, and Ethiopia that have lax labor laws where wages can be low and over overtime working um, I, is usually not paid. And in 2020, many factories in places like Bangladesh have ignored COVID-19 safety protocols and have continued to operate at full capacity. So what is the best uh, way to bark out fast, fast industry without working with workers? I have three ways for you to do that. So first one, make noise. A bark out cannot be silenced. Two, buy data, align your spending with your values by shopping mindfully. And three, stay humble and open to learning. When comfortable with, with discussing, discussing treatment of garden, garden, gar, garden workers because it wreaks of racism, violence, and colonialism. We still use the same global slave trade routes from the 18th century, where ships were back and forth to colonize nations, exploiting those countries of labor and um, raw goods to make others wealthy. So when we're dealing with the fashion industry, we are dealing with a system that in some ways haven't, hasn't changed that much. Um, so to finish, um, within the past decades, consumer attitudes, particularly towards sustainability and corporate transparency have pushed companies to reevaluate their labor. Practices and environmental impact of fashion. For example, this is uh, what we um, as the Anarchive do with your research on this. And for example, for the UN and other organizations, and um, I believe that our society is ripe for a green revolution among shoppers. Um, and um, now my colleague Darren is going to pass the video. And I just want to highlight that the clothes shops um, uh, collection date is going to be on the 24th and on the 26th of May. And um, yeah, thank you. I'll share my screen now. Um, we are quite short with time, so hopefully we have. Is there volume? No. No. Maybe maybe we can send the video because if um, I move on to the question and answer. Yeah. Yeah. Because if the sound's not coming through. Sure. Um, okay, we'll send, um, if you have put your emails at the end of when you registered, we'll be able to share the dates and the video at the um, end. Um, so we could take questions now. Um, so before we move on to taking the questions, if we're not sharing the video, can I just wait when our connection dates are? Because that's where we have those. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. So as part of the clothes swaps, to be able to engage in it, you need to donate your clothes first. Our clothes collections will take place on the 21st of May in um, at the University of Greenwich. And I think Olga's just put in the chat box. Um, so for that's for Dreadnought. And then once again, we will have another collection on the 26th of May. Um, but if you are urging and dying to donate clothes, but you can't make those dates, please let us know and we'll try and arrange something else. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Delora. Um, so I will start with the first question with, uh, from Malaya uh, to all the panelists uh, on what young people can do to challenge fast fashion. And this is open to all speakers. I would say I'll jump in. I mean, really, I mean, partly related to our work, but also I think very powerful for young people is, is similar to what you all are trying to do, right? Which I think is very admirable, um, which is to buy nothing new for at least a year, um, which is to me, not so much about the material impact that you're going to have as an individual. It's not as, you know, unfortunately you buy nothing new for a year isn't going to solve the waste crisis, but it's about the psychological detoxification um, because so much of what drives overproduction, overconsumption is this, you know, mentality that we are lacking, you know, and also that we don't know ourselves. Like some people always ask us why more people don't shop secondhand. Um, and I think a lot of it is because we've been taught that consumption should be convenient, that it should be the most convenient thing in the world, that you should walk into a store, see, you know, there's an advertisement that tells you exactly how to put a look together. You look on the rack, you can get anything in your size. And shopping secondhand is not like that. <laughs> you have to dig, you have to really know your personal style, you have to know yourself. And so if you can take a year to kind of heal um, from this messaging that we all receive constantly that we're not enough and that we should be a certain way that will help you moving forward to make more conscious decisions. I definitely agree. I mean, me and Alex, uh, who's also on um, here, um, was actually taking part in a research project at a shopping centre and us ourselves were being teased by the different items everything looking so sparkly and fresh and it's like buy me buy me but you're like no I can't <laughs> yeah but yeah I definitely agree yeah just to go off the back of that as well I think it's kind of the knowledge of having um the mindset where you're thinking to yourself okay I'm doing this for a bigger cause and a bigger picture rather than me just having that instant gratification of okay I've purchased this item I'm going to receive it tomorrow and then it's going to end up in the back of your wardrobe alongside all the other bits that you've purchased so I think if you kind of like think to yourself okay when I'm scrolling on Instagram yeah I'm seeing you know all these amazing looks and I'm seeing all these clothes and stuff but it's all very temporary and at, and at the end of the day you're purchasing clothes you know like you said for yourself to represent yourself and your style etc so you kind of have to think of it with you know a larger goal at the end rather than just being able to just buy something and have that nice feeling of you know I've bought this and it's coming today. Definitely. Um, the next question is by Sultan and she's asking whether why sustainable products are more expensive and thus less accessible. Very good question. I think I can jump in on that um, a little bit. I think I think it's it's not so much that sustainable products are more expensive it's that the fast fashion stuff is is artificially cheap um because don't you know the analogy i always use is if you can buy a t-shirt for example for less than the cost of a cup of coffee then how how you know and, and if you think about retailers like primark who um i think it's quite widely reported they make about 130 percent markup on just you know the stuff that's not in their sale and it's that even that it's 350 or something for a t-shirt isn't it so if you think about someone has to buy a cotton t-shirt for example cotton seeds they have to rent the land they have to plant them grow them look after the crops harvest them turn them into a textile and all the stages that that goes through and then it goes to a factory and it's it's shaped and cut and died and then it's shipped to the UK and it's put in a shop and you know and those if everyone in that state in that process has been paid properly um paid the value of their labor and the value of their of the commodity that they've used then you wouldn't be able to buy a t-shirt for three pound fifty <laughs> putting it putting it blindly so 
yeah, I think that that's my answer to it. Is that it's not necessarily more expensive. It's it's that the the other stuff is just too cheap, and it's often, you know, sometimes that they're, they're lost leaders as well. If you think about the was it Pretty Little Thing who did the um, who or something that did the one pound bikini last year, and it's they're obviously not making any money on that. It's just to get traffic through the site, so you ended up you end up buying more stuff that you don't need. Um, but I do understand that the sustainable stuff is more, in comparison, it's more expensive and therefore does kind of exclude people who are on a tighter budget. And, you know, I've been a student and you have to buy your, your socks in Asda sometimes because it's cheaper. It's just it's just the way that it is when you, you have to work to a budget. And that's that's obviously a wider economic problem than, um, than just fashion. Yeah, I would like to follow up. Sorry. Um, I'd like to follow up on that and I just want to emphasize that when you're buying sustainable, you're also buying, um, you're also paying the salaries for workers that um, if not, if you weren't paying that, they would be living in miserable conditions that have no uh, basic needs. So when you do that, you're paying, you'll know that the workers have a uh, good payment, that the products are um, sustainable and ethical when it comes to other com uh, companies like Google or Sting or Primark, you know that the people doing that, um, doing those garments are, are living in very degrading conditions and the payment that they're receiving is just to survive and not, is not to thrive. So when you do that, when you pay something that is sustainable, you're giving people a better option um, to live in just like when you when you buy fair trade do the same yeah. and to go back of um to go at the back of um what dan and what you just said eva it's not that sustainable fashion or sustainable brands are expensive it's just that we're more ethical <laughs> like that's just um just to put it simply but i can understand like not to shame people that do um uh, shop fast fashion because it's it's out there it's going to happen and it's true the way to go for the previous question as well it's the way it's branded as well it's more it's just easier to buy you don't have to dig through um secondhand clothing etc but yeah just to put it simply it's just more ethical and it it's you, when you're buying off of a, a sustainable brand it isn't just you're buying off of somebody's like idea and hard earned work and I think that's maybe the way we have to think about it just change the mentality slightly so that you can think about it and you're saving up for a more better quality piece that you have in your closet that will last a lot longer and you wouldn't just maybe throw away within maybe six months because of the quality it, it would last a lot longer in your closet. So it's more cost per wear, basically. Um, thank you, Lizzie. Um, Chami, I'm not sure if you're still here. Just wanted to ask the last question before we close. Yeah, very much, yeah. Yeah, um, so there is a question for you specifically. Um, so is it possible to use blockchain to achieve sustainability, especially in supply chains? Yeah, I saw it in the beginning. Uh, thanks very much for that question. Um, I've certainly seen blockchain for like uh, banking and um, land issues. Um, I think in terms of, you know, uh, multinational or international footprint, it can actually be quite useful for the um, uh, supply chain because it can connect the retail as well as the um, wholesale and the uh, manufacturers as well. So um, it's, it's definitely a, a good idea. I, I just don't know of any examples um, as yet, um, certainly not in the work that I've done looking at the um, uh, supply chain for the, uh, for the sari. Um, so yeah, if the uh, person who asked the question has any more ideas about uh, the use of blockchain in the uh, textile supply chain, that would be really useful to hear actually. Great, thank you, Chamu. Um, there are a lot of questions, but I think we're going to have to end it here. Um, please do look at the chat and there are dates 
for collection and the day of the close swap. Um, Olga, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to thank everyone uh, for to all the speakers. Thank you so much uh, 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 to support, for supporting our project uh, with this um, event. To all the people that attended, thank you so much. We we hope uh, it was uh, more interactive, even though we had a lot of uh, people talking at the same time uh, with the, without the mic. I guess we've all now are used to people muting us and not us not having to worry about not being heard or not because someone else has decided whether we can speak or not so uh we didn't want to do this this time so thank you so much to the archive team to the university Sorry. to the faculty yes someone wants to say something so yes yeah, so i just want to ask a quick question hi everyone um great chat so far um i think this is maybe primarily to the on icarf team um when it comes to like brick and mortar businesses for example, and fashion retailers, how, you know, how can they be more sustainable in their physical presence? Because everybody wants to market appropriately, you know, to their customer, and they want to, you know, have lots of lights and great fixing fixtures and lots of things that are going to enhance customer experience. So as well as, you know, doing things like clothes swaps, for example, how can businesses that are already on the ground, for example, be more sustainable physically? Gracia, that's a, that's a great question. However, we don't want to keep uh, the rest of the audience. So I'm just going to close here. And then maybe uh, if you get in touch with, with us, we can continue the conversation. Uh, because, um, you know, it's yeah. Friday afternoon. It's nearly the evening. The week is over. We're going to freeze all of us that we're going to try to get some time outside. But, uh, but I just uh, wanted to uh, thank everyone. And thank you, of course, to Fakar Rasa, who's just showed his uh, wonderful face. And he is the spirit as well of all we do as well. So everybody. Have a lovely evening. It's amazing to be in touch. Please do get in touch with us and follow us on Thank Instagram. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, speakers.